Welcome back to the Map Up Show. Great to have you rolling along with us on this Tuesday where big breaking news is coming out of the Supreme Court. Not just Roe v. Wade, but we're looking at some other cases. Let's go to our friend Rabbi Yakov Mankin. Great to have you on the show. Great to be here with you. Our friend uh, Cindy Groves, who hosts a Jewish podcast, wanted to, us to tell you hello. Yeah, she's a, she's a good friend. She said you were a great patriot, and I said, yes, he is. I've read some of your articles. I want everybody to check out the article we're going to post here on the uh, buffshow.com. It's Jewish progressives are dead wrong about a jo- abortion justice. This is Opinion and Newsweek. So we're going to post that article that uh, the rabbi mentioned there. But you also had some breaking news on a case that just came out today, which is very big, Carson versus Macon. Can you talk about that one for us? Yeah, the organization that I serve as managing director, Coalition for Jewish Values, participated in an amicus curiae to the Supreme Court saying, look, this is an obvious case of discrimination against religious parents who want to choose schooling. And with the big debate that's going on in the country right now over parental control of education, Maine law actually said, if you live in a jurisdiction where we don't have a school, you can send your kid to a school of your choice unless it's a religious school. We'll give you some money to send your kid to school but not to a religious school, even for the secular education. Nobody's talking here about giving money, tax money to religious education. It's talking about giving tax money to fulfill state education requirements in a religious school. And they weren't willing to fund that. Supreme Court said today that's unconstitutional, which is a huge win for parental rights and religious liberty. So can you give an example of what that means for somebody who wants to leave the public school system but couldn't afford it, now they have a better option? Well, there's states across the country, Ohio, Illinois, where they've put in voucher programs. And in a lot of cases, there's been debate about, are you allowed to spend a education voucher to send your kid to a religious school where they will receive the secular education requirements of the state? The Supreme Court has now announced you have to permit that. That's again, it's a huge it's not just about Maine. It's about schools across the country being able to serve more children. I mean, especially in the wake of covid and how disastrously the public schools dealt with covid lockdowns as compared to private schools. Parents are going to be choosing. It's worth the money. And now the state is being told, if you're going to support any form of alternate education, you have to support parents in the parochial schools too. So that's a good start and maybe a good lead into the Roe v. Wade case we're going to talk about here in a second. But you were very pleased with that outcome. Do you do you remember what uh, number was it? Was it six to three? Well, how, how was How did that break down? That was a six to three ideological decision. You can probably guess which the three votes were. Yes, I probably can. And that's unfortunate because they're the same three that voted against a Jewish bake or a baker not wanting to bake a gay wedding cake. They voted against that individual right. It's just really scary how ideological some of these justices have become. It's. You know, if if we didn't have um, one of the things that people talked about about the previous administration was that it changed the judicial system for decades to come to strict constitutionalists who will actually look at the Constitution for what it says and not what it, they wish it would have said. Yeah, Roe v. Wade is a classic example, by the way, of yeah, judges is- deciding a case based on what they wish the Constitution would have said. <laughs> Absolutely. <clears throat> that takes us right into the Roe v. Wade case. But you're exactly right. That is Trump's lasting legacy, the Supreme Court. And that's why you see angry Democrats in Congress saying, maybe we should just expand it. Maybe we should expand the court until we get what we want. But Rabbi, wouldn't the expansion just continue on until there's 47 of them, depending on the administration that's in power? <laughs> I, I, I think that there's a slippery slope here that they're recognizing. Uh, the truth is that Trump couldn't got, have gotten through half of his nominees if uh, Harry Reid had not changed the rules 
for filibusters on judicial nominees. The only difference that the uh, the previous uh, gov- you know, that they made when Trump was in power is that Mitch McConnell said, we're going to apply that to Supreme Court justices, too. You're going to change the rules for every other kind of justice and every other level. But happens to be that Trump made massive changes at that level also. So we now have judges for decades to come who are going to actually judge by the law. And again, not by what they wish the law would have said. Let's dive into this article. Jewish progressives are dead wrong about abortion justice. This is a Newsweek article. We're going to post that link. We're on with Rabbi Yaakov Menken. He's managing director, Coalition for Jewish Values. And you talk about in this article, and I was going to ask you, there's a lot of left-wing Jews out there that are standing there supporting Roe v. Wade, which is um, basically they're saying abortion access is a Jewish value, plain and simple. But that doesn't really make sense when you look at the tenets. No, that's that's definitely not what the Bible has to say about the value of life. And uh, basically, Judaism itself is not about us making all kinds of choices with things like life. There's obligations and requirements and rights, yes, but that, that goes into a scope where you also have requirements and obligations. And one of those obligations is to protect life. And there's been a lot of distortion in the public debate. You're right about what Jews say and also what about everybody says. I mean, what yeah. it is to be it. it I once uh, recently I was in a conversation with someone who said, well, you know, I'd like to say I'm pro-life, but I believe in preserving the life of the mother. And I was like, who ever told you that's not a pro-life position? In fact, if you ask Americans United for Life, they will tell you there isn't a pro-life national organization that isn't promoting a law that has a carve out for the life of the mother. Everybody believes the life of the mother has to come first. That's the pro-life position, not the pro-choice position. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. And this goes beyond Judaism. This goes into liberal Christians as well in our faith, where we have people out there in churches and other dioceses t- talking about how they are pro-choice, that that the government, what they always say, the government shouldn't be involved. Well, that's what the Supreme Court decision that's coming down says. The government will no longer be involved. We're going to create more democracy and give it back to you, the people. <laughs> that's That's one of the classic distortions about this whole debate is that the court has no ability to stop a person from getting an abortion or to make a person get an abortion or anything like that. They only have the ability to tell you whether a particular law comports with the Constitution of the U.S. And there's certainly nothing in the Constitution about abortion. It's something that states or the federal government get to decide. And that, you know, that's look, that's the American system is the American way. Certainly from Judaism's perspective, and and I think in any religion, it's actually really offensive to claim that a medical procedure is tied to a particular religion. Well, I love how in your article, when you talked about the Jewish rally for abortion justice, you use the term boulder dash. We don't use that enough. We need more (laughs) more terms of boulder dash. You use that in the article. Very good. You know, I wrote that article a month ago. You have to remind me what I said. <laughs> okay, yeah. You know, I know, I know. obviously, I'm still on point because this is stuff that we believe for about 3,300 years or so. But when it comes to, you know, what I actually said, I didn't remember I used that term. That's that, you know, thank, thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, it's so good because I can tell, you know, when you can see somebody's writing with emotion, this is great. You said the transparent and patently dishonest message of the Jewish rally for abortion justice is that valuing life is neither a matter of common sense nor an American principle, but rather a patriarchally Christian tenet and further a tenet that constitutes a violation of the much ballyhooed separation of church and state. Boulder dash. (laughs) That's look, it's true. I mean, this is something the founding fathers were all deeply religious. They did not believe that separation of church and state meant that religious values are not allowed to be reflected in American public policy. That's a crazy idea, especially when it comes to a moral question. 
where do we get morality from, if not the Bible or our own warped thinking? And that, that's the thing. The left would like you to believe that their warped thinking has to be taken at face value as if it were some form of, well, excuse me for borrowing the term, gospel. Well, the Jewish faith and the Christian faith cannot pull an AOC and talk about other religions because if you truly believe in your faith, God says, I knew you when you were in the womb and before you were in the womb. So that makes life at conception have more of an argument. But AOC goes out and say, well, different religions promote different things. Fine. Let's take the Jewish and Christian aspect out of it. Let's just follow the science, shall we? Oh, no, we don't follow the science unless it's political expediency. That's a really interesting point, because everything we've learned since 1973 about fetal life is that it is far more vibrant than we knew previously. They didn't have ultrasounds in 1973. Now they've gotten to the point where we understand that not only is a baby in the womb learning to recognize his or her parents' voices, but actually recognizing musical tunes. Start playing the crib, you know, the whatever that thing is over the crib to the baby before he or she is born, because they will be soothed by that music more when it reminds them of the familiarity of the womb. That's an incredible concept. And of course, it's entirely predicated on the idea that the baby in the womb is alive and thinking. Yes, indeed. And that's why also they place the baby on the mother's chest right away to calm a baby down if there's some sort of issue. The best thing you can do is that skin to skin action. Those feelings that the baby has immediately didn't just start upon exit. They have had those feelings in the womb. And that's hearing right. the heartbeat. Yes, hearing they, they also by that not just any skin, but right there to hear the mother's heartbeat because the baby has learned that that's a comforting sound. Rabbi Mankin, can you come back on the show after this comes down? This uh, comes down from the Supreme Court, and we see a little bit of reaction from the the riots that we're going to see. Can you come back on to discuss that? Uh, ab absolutely. I, I don't look forward to any rioting, but I'd be glad to discuss the outcome. Yes, that would be great, because like we said in this interview, it actually is coming back to the states. And we earlier talked about on the show the economic impact of that with with Rabbi Mankin. We can talk about the emotional impact and what it actually means. So one for one on Carson versus Macon today. Let's hope the Supreme Court continues this good tra trajectory and does the right thing. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. Very good. Thank you for having me. Looking forward to more victories. Absolutely. So are we, especially in this day and age. <laughs> we'll be, we'll see you tomorrow on the Buff Show. You guys.